All right. Hey, we are live here with our uh, monthly update. What's happening in the Denver uh, Metro real estate market. Now, for those that are a little curious as to what happened to last month's update video, well, we have the recording. It's just we had some tech issues and we're not able to go live uh, last month. Uh, and I've not quite figured out how to unlock this to get it back and, and up and going. So um, consistency, we did it. Uh, but tech is not my strong suit. Um, so as, as we take a look at the real estate market, what's going on, what's happening? Uh, joined as always, right? Brenna with Land Title. Now Land Title puts together stats, the data of what happened that made our real estate market what it is. So that we get an opportunity to interpret and analyze what's going on. So that we get to be the opportunity um, or get to be the, the vessel for you know, the, the best information, kind of what's going on, not just, Hey, my neighbor around this, the, the corner said this about the housing market. And I heard from my barber, you know, or my hairstylist or whoever you go to for that, that this is what the real estate market's doing. We want to be that source. So, um, Brenna, how are you today? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, appreciate it. So um, as we're rounding out the summer for most people, right? Kids are going to be going back to school. Uh, what's been your biggest highlight so far this summer? And I'm just putting you on the spot. Figured I'd throw that one out at you. Didn't prepare for it. Um, you know, I think, I don't know if it was the biggest highlight, but um, we got to go to the Keys in May um, with some friends and it was so nice. Um as much as I love my son, um, for him not to be there <laughs> and just to have some adult time with some great people um, and just travel. We haven't been able to travel for the last year. So I think that was definitely one of the highlights um, of summertime. Yeah, you're, you're a Florida native. You were born in Florida. Uh, first time to the Keys. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, so, so let's talk about our real estate market, right? The, the sense is that things are really cooling down and a lot of the conversations that I'm hearing or having, or having discussions around, um, gosh, this market's just shifted and everything's changed. And, you know, we're going to see a whole flood of homes hit the market when this, uh, this stay on, on foreclosures finally passes, right. And, and that's going to happen. Then we're going to see a whole bunch of homes hit the market. What, uh, what's the data saying? What, what's actually going on? Yeah. You know, I think, um, that's something that I have been noticing too. And I've been chatting with different people about, uh, we just really need to dissect the narrative of what's actually going on because I've heard a surge in inventory or, you know, different words like that. And it's just not what the numbers are showing us. And, um, it, there are some changes and in the real estate market, those small changes or shifts do make a difference in strategy on both the buying and the selling side. Um, but it's not a landslide. So, you know, at least not currently, you know, and as far as what we're seeing and people smarter than me are saying, um, that's not the direction that we're going. S some of what's going on is extremely healthy for our market. Um, and I think it can be very easy to get wrapped up in the headlines, um, not just in real estate and everything, but, you know, you see one little headline or one little data point and you're like, oh my goodness, maybe I shouldn't sell, maybe I shouldn't buy. It's whatever's going on, the market's crashing, like, and um, if we look at the data, it's that's not what's happening. And so, you know, we've said it before, buying and selling homes can be a very emotional transaction because it's usually um, the biggest financial transaction that most people make. So we want to give you some numbers to take out some of that emotion um, and help guide you a little bit. It's still going to be emotional, um, but at least for me, I like to have a game plan. It helps me feel calm. Um, and that's really the goal here. So I will share my screen here, Matt, if you want to put that up. 
Yeah, once it pops up, we'll, we'll get that going, right? Now, um, you know, wh why are we passionate about this, right? Well, the average net worth of somebody that owns a home is $230,000. Now, for comparison, your renter is only $5,000, right, for their net worth. <laughs> so the, the folks that have been on the sidelines and waiting, especially if you've been renting, that say, hey, you know what, we're just going to wait until the market um, shifts, right? We're going to wait till this thing corrects uh, before we end up buying a home. They've likely missed out on so much equity, so much appreciation in the market, so much um, debt pay down, the, the, the tax savings. In fact, I've got a great new tool uh, that if you're interested, let me know. And it's a, um, it's a net worth calculator around your home ownership, right? What is home ownership worth? specific numbers, right? Okay, if I buy a home at this price, take the average appreciation, uh, historical, right? Um, across the US and what are my tax advantage savings? What are my uh, debt pay down savings, et cetera? It's a huge number, it's pretty astounding. So um, nobody can time the market, right? If you, if you read books about investing in the stock market, they're gonna tell you, nobody can time the market. If they are telling you they can time the market, my guess is they're probably selling you something and it's not actually real. Studies show that people that try to time the market end up doing worse than the market over time. The housing market is very much the same way. So if you're not in the game, you're waiting for things to um, you know, collapse so that you can buy super cheap, you, you may be waiting for a very long time. In fact, for me, over the last eight years, I've been hearing that all the time that we're headed for this just crash and it's going to come. And here we are eight years later. What's the appreciation some of those people have missed out on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. So we're looking at the screen, the, the greater Denver Metro um, stats, local insights, right? For 2021 for July. Perfect. Okay. So if we go here to this is our highlight reel or kind of very high level what's going on. Um, so what we're seeing as far as this slowdown um, is really in line with the seasonal shift that we've gotten used to seeing um, the last several years, with the exception of 2020. 2020 was an outlier. We don't want to repeat it. But if we look at some of the trends that we have seen um, prior to that, some of what we're seeing here uh, is really in line with that. So slightly less demand, um, a little bit more inventory, a small dip in the average sales price, um, a slightly smaller closed to uh, list to closed ratio. So all of that, if you just read it, sounds like, okay, we're down in this, we're down in that, we're down in this. So we are slowing down and oh my gosh, what's happening? But if we look here, active listings, we peaked at 3,800 um, with an increase of 12.5% month over month. Um, that is 428 homes. So yes, it's double digit increase month over month, but it's still less than 500 homes coming onto the market. Um, we have three and just three and a half, 3.3 3 million uh, people in Denver 420 homes um, added to a very small number is not a landslide. It's so about 70 homes per county for what this report, right? We're just talking about the seven major Denver metro counties, that 400 some, right? That's, that's roughly about 70 homes per county uh, across all price points, right? When you start to divide that up, that's not much coming back on the market. It's not. Um, pending listings were down 6% month over month. Um, the pending is that under contract. So they're just a little bit uh, slower as we move into the end of the summer. And then the sold listings were down 7.6% month over month, which follows suit um, again with that seasonal shift. Now I will show you on a later slide, we're still up considerably um, year to date. So January through July. So we're still having an extremely strong year. Um, and that this next stat goes to show you that. So percent sold to list price. 
So from what you listed your home at, what is the percent um, that it sold at of the list price? So we're at 104.5%. Now that is down one and a half percent, but that is still astronomically, historically so high. Um, so typically at this time of year, we peak out right around maybe slightly above um, 100% of list price. And uh, normally we sit around 98 to 99, um, you know, on, in the other months. So we peaked out at like 106%. So if you look at that graph, and I'll show you here in a little bit, that's a massive difference. So that coming down is good. Um, that doesn't mean that it's a bad time to list your home, you're still going to get the great value, especially with some of this appreciation that we've been talking about. It just makes it uh, a little bit more sustainable. Uh, that pace was was not sustainable. So I'm, I'm happy to see that coming down. That is a good thing. Yeah, more, more in line with, with people being able to make a move on a home, right? I mean, think about anything else you shop for anywhere. Right. You see a price and you're like, OK, I'll pay that for that widget, that truck, this pair of tennis shoes, that purse, fill in the blank. Uh, so think about going into Target and you're looking at, you know, a, um, a chair, for example. You're like, oh, a chair is one hundred dollars. And you get up to the register. They're like, actually, for you to buy it, it's one hundred and four dollars and fifty cents. Then you get taxes on it. Right that just doesn't happen. This is a, this is an anomaly that we're going through that it's that frequent. Yes, absolutely. Um, as we go down here, the average sold price for that detached single family dropped down below 700,000 to 691. Um, again, that's, that's not scary or, or uncommon. Um, peaking out. We, we are, and we talked about this um, in previous months, that our peak of the buying season, we were anticipating happening a little bit sooner than it typically does. Um, and you'll see that we're kind of cooling a little bit sooner, but we did start a lot sooner as well. So again, people are really enjoying summer after not being able to last year. Um, you know, they've been in this crazy market for so long. There's some buyer fatigue there. They're getting ready. They're geared up for school. What that's going to look like this year. Those all play a factor into people's buying and selling decisions. So this, these slight adjustments here are uh, anticipated. Yeah, I think, and I heard recently that na nationally we were looking at, at about selling 7 million homes uh, for 2021, right? That was kind of the pace that we were on at the start of the year. Now that's scaled back. So this is happening here in Denver. It's happening um, across the nation that fewer homes are, are being sold as we get into uh, the rest of the year. Again, doesn't mean that it's shifting, the market's flipping, but it does mean that, you know, we, there's some things we want to pay attention to and that, you know, there's some seasonality here that we, we get to play with. Absolutely. Um, and interest rates are still historically low. So that is one thing that's helping out with this extreme appreciation that we have going on. Um, and that's why I would encourage you, if you are uh, looking to enter the market as a buyer um, and maybe have said, OK, I'm going to save for a year or two more, um, maybe have a talk with with Matt and with your lender and see if there are solutions that make sense for your situation where you can take advantage of those interest rates um, during you know, this, this summer cool down or whatever you want to call it. Um, because interest rates, we don't know when they're going to go up, but they are going to go up. And then that just makes everything more expensive. So take advantage of that gift because um, it's not going to be there forever. And the Denver market is still strong and thriving. So this time next year, more than likely, we are going to see even higher prices than we are now. And, and that's a lot of what we're hearing from other economists, right? We're going to see probably appreciation over the next 12 months that this same time next year, it's going to be higher than it is today. So, um, you know, some appreciation, right? A healthy appreciation is good. Uh, you know, 30 plus percent in a year is a, a little scary of a, of a number, um, you know, but when we look at what's going on right now, if you're a buyer in the market, 
hold out a little bit longer, right? I think you're going to have a couple more options to choose from. Now, we're not going to be able to delay and, well, let's sleep on it overnight, see if it's still there tomorrow. You may still have to pay over list price, but you might not be competing with 37 offers. Maybe it's four, maybe it's you know one or two. It's still probably competing, but it won't be the same rat race. Absolutely. Okay, this is the market snapshot that we take a look at every month. This is detached single family and attached single family combined. Um, the green is active, the blue is pending or under contract, and the red is sold. Um, so what this is really good for is to see how things um, move and work together on the trend lines and then how they correlate with each other. So you can see here, um, 2020 is a little bit different. The biggest difference, or sorry, 2021, the biggest difference obviously from 2019, which is our closest uh, year in recent trends. So 2020, take it with a grain of salt, take a look at it. Um, but really that didn't follow any of the trends that we have come to know uh, in the Denver real estate market in the past several years. So if we're comparing to 2019, the biggest difference is the active listing. So basically it's the inverse of what we were seeing in um, in that 2019. And yes, we've had two consecutive months of positive um, increase in active listings, which is awesome, but we are still almost 50% down from last year and even more than that down um, from this time in 2019. But if you take a look at the pendings and solds compared to 2019, we're still a little bit above, but we're much more in line uh, with those trends. So so really the, the low, low inventory is playing a huge part in um, the supply and demand ratio. And you took almost the words out of my mouth, right? I was going to say, hey, Brenda, look, we've got a trend. There's two months in a row where we've had an increase in active homes. We haven't seen two consecutive months of increase since March, April of 2020. And then again, we've had a month and then it continued to decline. When we look yeah. back at 2019, we got three months as the, as the peak was happening for active inventory, right? As we got, you know, from March, April to May, we got three months in there um, of an increase. So, yeah, we may be headed for, uh, you know, our, our summertime typical increase in inventory finally. Yeah, I would be totally good with that. Because as you can see, you know, we have um, during those summer months, people put typically they put more things on the market. And so we get a little bit of a buildup and we haven't, we've been a seller's market um, for several years here in Denver, but not this extreme. But last year we got just a few months of people putting their homes on the market and then everything shut down. So any kind of um, bench or, or buildup of inventory to kind of get us through that heavy buying season just didn't exist. So we were starting in a deficit and that's what you're seeing here. Um, so that's kind of what we use this graph for. This is detached and attached. If you, depending on where you're looking, this is detached. So for right now, it looks fairly similar. If we dive into the numbers, there's a few differences. Um, mostly in some of the active inventory uh, as we went into the beginning part of this year, but attached single family is a little bit different here if we take a look at that. Um, so I think it's always good to take the bird's eye view and then depending what you are looking at and you know if you're a seller, what are you, is your home attached or detached or if you're a buyer, wh which market are you looking at just to make sure that you're looking at the the best data for your situation. Yeah, the, the 30,000 foot view may not give us the the true story of what's happening in your neighborhood. And that's why real estate's such a hyper local um, business, right? When we look at, at what's going on, it pays really to have a local real estate expert to interpret what's going on in your neighborhood. You know, there's some pockets that you can get a good deal right now as a buyer. It doesn't mean it's happening everywhere. Absolutely. Yeah. 
So this is our active listing analysis. Um, I know we've talked a lot about active listings uh, already, but that seems to be a hot point. But as far as that surge goes, right, we're at 3,800. Um, back in 2019, we were at 10,000. And for a balanced market, anywhere between 20 and 30,000. So we'd have to double the amount of listing or the amount of active, yeah, um, active listings in 2019 and we are far below that right now. So it's a good thing that we're having uh, this increase in inventory and we would like it to continue. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull this stat out now um, for anybody that's watching or pay atten paying attention, uh, call me out with the specific number. I'm just going off of memory here, kind of flying without a safety net. If I remember correctly, 2019 saw an appreciation over the course of the year of around six, seven, maybe 8%, um, if I remember correctly, which was a slower year than what we had been kind of accustomed to the, the couple of years before uh, until last year, right? When we saw a 31 and a half percent increase there in the average sales price. But, um, you know, that appreciation a little bit more palatable. Yeah. And, you know, for context, the national average is 4%. So, you know, I got lucky when I sold my first home. Um, I had some 14% appreciation over a couple of years and, and that was really nice for me, but that was not uh, typical. So even though seven, eight, nine percent whatever that was in 2019 seemed lower, it was still well above the national average. Um, and like Matt said, 30% for last year is, is not a good place to be either, even though, you know, if you're selling at the right point, it's not a bad deal. But as far as market health, uh, not sustainable. Yeah. And we'll see what becomes the new norm, what becomes the new sustainability. If we look at historical average, it's about 4%. If we move this new trend line and start a new trend line, what is it going to become maybe over the last five years to the next five years and what does that new trend look like and what's sustainable the the math is always very interesting if you're a geek like me and like nerding out on this it's cool to see kind of where the trends are and then look back what happened in the economy at that moment what transpired that, that caused these numbers to be what they are this kind of plays to the active listings. This is month supply of inventory. So if no more homes came on the market, how long will it take? would it take for all of our inventory to dry up? Um, the National Association of Realtors says six months. Um, Denver economists say closer to like three or four months. Um, and we have finally passed two weeks and I think we're at about three weeks of inventory right now. Um, so again, if we're comparing July back to July of 2019, when we had just shy of two and a half months of inventory, that felt so much better, even though it was a seller's market still um, than just this three weeks. So we have a long way to go, and um, but it's good to see it going in the right direction. Yeah, right. And this is where we look at, at the percentages when it comes to small numbers, right? If I've got uh, two weeks, it goes to three weeks. Well, gosh, that, that was a 50% increase. So that 50% that sounds like, oh my gosh, the sky's falling, everything's changing. Well, let's temper expectations. We're talking about small numbers and percentages seem really bigger. If we were at you know three months and went to four and a half months, that's a much bigger, much bigger swing, same exact percentage. Yes. So that's why I'm saying like, if you're, if you're looking on social media and you see some big percentage um, and it, and you know, with a tagline, like, you know, what's happening, what's the shift? Is this, what's going on? Just dive into the numbers a little bit more um, because it is important to look at them and, it could be that there's a big shift happening or it could be um, a big percentage of a really small number. So you just got to take a little bit of a, a deeper look. Yeah, look a little deeper, right? Understand that some of these, they, they want you to click on and read the articles. So they're going to make it sound a little bit more outlandish. They're going to embellish a little bit. That's probably journalism. Uh, if I was in that field, I'd probably do that too, right? Thankfully, I'm not. I get to just be a real estate agent. Um, and interpret the real numbers, I don't have to worry about selling news subscriptions. <laughs> no. 
So our days on MLS is um, days on market. It's the speed of the market. Um, so this is the average at 10 days. Um, you get to a certain point with the averages and it's really hard to go below that because you're always going to have the homes that go extremely, you know, in just a couple of hours, but then you're also going to have those homes that sit on the market because they are overpriced or um, because of the condition or maybe even the location. Um, so 10, as you can see, is obviously again historically low and even slow and even a little bit faster than we've seen um in the other months that you know the past months of this year where it's been so so quick our median days on market is still right at about four days so for me this tells me a few things a there may be a few less people going under contract but they're still very committed to getting under contract and they're getting out there quickly. Um, they are used to the speed and they're continuing that speed. The other thing it tells me is if you're a seller and you miss the mark on your pricing, you need to make a quick and efficient um, correction or your house is going to sit. Um, you know, we've got a house in our market that's been on the on the market for or in our neighborhood that's been on uh, the market for about a month um at least at, yeah at least and so people are starting to ask you know what's wrong with it you know what's going on so it gets kind of that stigma around it and as a seller that is not what you want so um matt do you want to speak to those uh price corrections or what have you whatever you want yeah for sure right and if i'm if i'm picking on the home in, in our neighborhood um and i can right because if you're watching this i assume you care about my my opinion um, it, it started way too high on the price, right? We cannot just throw any price and, and the buyers don't understand value. They're just going to pay whatever for it because you happen to have it. Um, and, and it wasn't marketed really well, right? You take a look at the photos and, um, oh my gosh, it looks like there's a very, very tiny kitchen, uh, in this, what started over a $700,000 home and, and just not done very well. Price Pricing the property correctly um, is super important. Now there's the art and the science behind it. Where do you price it? What's the strategy? My advice for all of my clients is always this. Look, let's take a look at what the market says. The market says it's between here and here. We need to price between here and here. Now, if your home's a whole lot nicer, we can price a little above the market. If your home's not as nice, we, we got to go below. But if your home's an average home and it should be right here in the market and you want to start super high, you're not going to get the same value. They're going to look at your neighbor's home. They're going to look at your home and say, well, they've got better value. I'm going to go there. And everybody may be interested in that house and they may end up paying more for the house next door than they would at yours at the same price. So when it comes down to price corrections, you have to make price corrections quickly and, and make the correct price adjustments. Because I look at a lot of real estate, uh, I can't tell you how many times I'll see a price correction or a reduction that's, you know, a thousand dollars. Or, you know, I think I saw one not too long ago that was for a dollar. Uh, now, now I promise you nobody is a dollar or even a thousand dollars away from buying their dream home. They might not be looking at it because it's $10,000 above their budget. And with the market the way that it's going, they may not believe they could even compete. So pricing within the market is so critical and the data will tell you if you're overpriced or not. Um, and thankfully we've got the, the tools at our fingertips uh, to interpret that and decide what's the market telling us? Are we priced right and we need to just hold off for this week or, or did we miss the mark and we need to make an adjustment immediately so that we can get it under contract? Absolutely. Um, you know, something else to consider as we look at this sold analysis um, is that timing does make a difference. And even though we're saying that these big or these little changes aren't a big deal, um, 
they're not a big deal as far as like the health of the market, but they are a big deal to keep track of your strategy. So if you are um, buying, how aggressive do you need to be? If you're selling, how aggressive can you be in pricing? So if you're looking at this sold, um, you can see if we go back to 2019, um, that we kind of peaked out in our solds in May, um, and then it went down in June. We had a little blip in July, but then so mostly May and then come back down. Um, here, we peaked out in June, but we, <coughs> excuse me, we started with that over 5,000 homes sold in March versus May, so a little bit earlier. Um, but We'll see again in August. I would I would anticipate this continues to come down. So we're on the, the back half of the wave. So if you're looking at this and my neighbor sold their home in June and I'm going in and I'm in August now, I need to take a look at what's happening because if my neighbor's house sold in June, they listed it in May. Um, and now how many months later, what is the market doing? So those small adjustments, even though it's still a really strong market, we can't be quite as aggressive and get the same return. Because typically the first seven days that your home is on the market is when you're going to get the highest and best offers. So it's not one of those where you can just say, well, let's just try this out and then we can pull back later. You're really going to miss out on um, some money in your pocket in most cases on that. So Yes, the comps in the, the neighborhood are good um, to take a look at, but it also you also have to take a look at, at what's happening, not in May, not in June, what's happening now. Yeah, so, so pricing, when we talk about pricing the market, oftentimes I want to think like the appraiser would because most of the time a loan's involved and the appraiser is going to kind of dictate how things go. So we're looking at you know what's sold, what's under contract, and, and those are all lagging measures, right? Those things have already happened. So when it comes to pricing strategy, oftentimes I'm gonna look outside of the box, right? An appraiser is not going to really consider a home that's on the other side of a busy street that goes to a different school, but a buyer might, right? They might look at Arvada and Westminster, even though they might be five miles apart in, in these two homes. So what does your current competition look like, right? Within the price range, if we want to be at 550, well, what else could somebody buy at 550? And, and do you have a better home or is it not as nice? Because that's going to play a little bit of a factor. So again, it's more data, more information to tell the story. So we have to know what's going on today so that we can get the home priced uh, appropriately. Okay, average sold price. So this is what we're talking about with appreciation and um, really taking advantage of the interest rates. Um, I also heard something uh, from the Denver Metro Association of Realtors this week that I thought was really interesting. Um, so Denver is on the top 10 list for desirable places to live or Colorado, um, but we're not on the top 10 for um, how expensive we are. So even though we we have these massive gains and we're feeling like affordability is an issue and that's a real thing, there's a lot of other places that are a lot more expensive. And those people are moving to Colorado. So they think that these prices are extremely affordable comparatively and they're coming in and they are not afraid to pay the prices because it's better than New York City or Silicon Valley or Oregon or what have you. Um, so that was just kind of an interesting uh, perspective um, and little insight. I was like, okay, that makes sense. Well, and from my perspective, we are way better to live than any of those places. So uh, secrets are already out. You know, it's funny. I, I met with a potential client here this week. Uh, from South Carolina, and they're wanting to move to Denver partly for uh, the the affordability and cost of living, and and a lot of folks are questioning that decision. South Carolina to Denver, like, well, you, you got to understand this person's coming from Charleston, uh, South Carolina, right? Very expensive place to live. Um, so here, potentially a little bit more affordable. 
Yeah. So as we look at this, this is the average sold price for detached single family. Um, now we did go down slightly about 4% month over month, which is about $29,000. But year over year, we're up $103,000 um, or about 17.6%. So that is a massive number. Um, so even as we enter the second half of the year, if this number goes down a little bit and teeters off or maybe even plateaus a little bit, it's still considerably higher than it was in 2020, 2019, and all of the previous years. And if you look at it, this little dip in average sold price is totally normal. So as far as a good investment, yes, absolutely, still a great investment because over the course of the year, I would be very, very shocked if we don't maintain double digit appreciation for 2021. If you're a buyer in the second half, take advantage of that $29,000 price break um, and get, in, get into a home so you can take advantage of that six figure appreciation potentially um, in the next 12 months. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And this is just our sold units year to date. Um, so we are up 13% um, over last year so far. Now we did have an uncharacteristic second half of the year in 2020. Typically things all kind of come out in the wash, um, relatively speaking, as far as how many homes are sold, it's just how they're dispersed. So we had a very, very strong first half of the year. So we'll see what the second half of the year brings. Um, it would not surprise me if it it follows and tapers down a little bit. Um, and, and who knows if we'll outpace last year, maybe it just won't be a uh, double digit, maybe it'll just be a few percentage points or maybe we'll be about even. Um, but this just kind of gives you a look as to last year versus this year where we're at. It's still, still climbing, right? When we look at it overall sold homes, uh, market's still moving quick. That means more people are selling than what they did in 2019. So when, when we're saying there's not much inventory, it doesn't mean that homes aren't coming on the market. Sellers are deciding every day to sell their home. They're just getting gobbled up so fast. Yep. The okay, last one I want to go over is this uh, sold to list price. Um, and this one, it actually changed a little bit this month. So you can't see what it normally looks like. Um, so even here in January, we are probably at about 101%. Um, typically, that would be below that 100% mark. But you know, we were climbing, climbing, climbing all the way to 106%. So it does look like a big drop off to get all the way down to 104%. Um, but that's still so, so high. Um, and if you look in the 500,000 to 500 uh, to 600,000 price point, we're still at 105,000. So this is one of those stats, especially as a buyer, um, if you're looking to make an offer, I would really dive into the price range specifically because those percentages are pretty different um, between them. And it you just want to make sure you kind of have a good idea of what you need to expect. And you might not have to pay as much as you think you do or as much as you did a few months ago. So just again, some of that strategy for making sure um, that you get the home, but also that you um, don't overpay unnecessarily. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Keeping an eye what's going on. What is it going to take to get the home purchase the dream home? Yeah. Well, that's all I have uh, for today. Right. So wrapping up, I think overall, you know, my interpretation of the market is the market's still very, uh, it, it's it's still bananas, right? It's still moving. It, it's still crazy. If you're writing offers, likely you're writing offers over and, and you're still kind of, you know, pitching the kitchen sink to them, throwing in the farm, everything that you can. Um, now, if you find the house that nobody else knows about, or you find the one that nobody else really wants and not everybody's chasing, you get more opportunities. And I think we're going to see inventory start to grow a little bit. Still going to be a seller's market. And there's going to be opportunities in any market, regardless of what you do. 
Um, and I think that's that's what the data is telling me. Every single month, it's kind of the same thing. Still opportunities. Your strategy is a little different if you're a seller or a buyer or an investor. But, you know, there's still opportunities in every market. Absolutely. So, all right. As, um, you know, we get wrapped up here, football is really around the corner, right? Preseason games have started for the NFL. Uh, college football is uh, is also coming. Right. Huge football fan. I love it. I'm a big Bills fan, oddly enough, and an Ohio State Buckeyes. As a kid born and raised in Denver, that makes me kind of unpopular. Yes. Um, so what uh, what are you looking forward to for football season this year? The Florida State being a little better than they were last year, hopefully. <laughs> so, you know, I think we're on the rebuild, but it's been a tough couple of years. And as a Bills fan, you know about it tough couple of years so a tough couple of decades as, as it turned out right but things are looking good we'll, we'll see if we can continue our growth here uh from what last year happened moving on quarterback got paid massive contract um if i had josh allen's money i'd burn mine but you know that's <laughs> just there so um perfect brenna um thank you again to everybody at land title that puts this data together because uh, personally, while I love interpreting the data and looking at it, I don't want to have to input it all or or like collect all that data. So no. just so very grateful to the folks at Land Title that, that are doing that. Um, if you're watching this and you're in the process of refinancing your house, you can tell your lender who you want the title company to be. Not ashamed. I'm going to tell you Land Title is my favorite. Uh, clearly, I have a bias. Doesn't mean that I'm wrong. Um, Land Title does some phenomenal things. So send it on over to Brenna at Land Title and uh, you'll be my hero. Well, thank you. We'd love to help you. Uh, perfect. All right. Well, for those that tuned in, thank you so much. Um, and we'll see you again next month. Hopefully we'll figure out our tech issue. We'll get last month's ready to go and up posted online. So, all right. Thanks, Brenna. Have a great day. We'll see you guys soon.